we'll talk about dowsing, we'll talk about spiritual experiences, we'll talk about the nature of reality um, and all of that sort of stuff. So I thought we would, because um, I had a whole bunch of um, stories, uh, experiences that I was going to relay last time. The reason for um, sort of talking about those things is not, you know, like I said last time, I'll repeat it again for the benefit of anybody who missed it last time, but the, the reason to, to, to talk about this stuff uh, is not to sort of brag or say what amazing experiences they were, but to share and to highlight the fact that as you as one goes through a spiritual awakening and one in, investigates more deeply the inner universe, um, then these sort of things can occur. It's not unusual. And, and actually, while, um, you know, if you listen to anybody's stories or if you listen to a, a you know, a particularly sensitive uh, medium um, or, you know, clairvoyant or somebody like that or any of these um, sort of people, then, you know, you can think, wow, that's amazing. Wish I was like that. Um, but let's not, you know, go into that whole kind of comparison thing. For most of us, um, this sort of sensitivity and access into these subtle realms does actually vary. You know, if you think about most of these experiences as being like a, a wave, you know, sometimes the peak of the wave will give you the peak experience of access into that other dimension, into that uh, subtle realms as you go into that peak. But, you know, you're, we all work on these different rhythms through life and through different phases and through the different times of the day and the month and the years. And we're all absolutely unique and individual. And so it's very rare that most of us stay in that kind of peak experience. So the question is, you know, um, how do we, well, I mean, I suppose it's very straightforward. It's only people like me that tend to overthink this sort of thing that would say, well, right, so how do we frame this? How do we consider this to be? Do we accept that ET is exactly that, exactly what it is, these experiences? Or uh, do we sort of try to shift our awareness of what we are as a potential creator? And you'll know that most of the time that's where I go. I'm going to do a little video, uh, a pre-recorded video about making contact with trees and conversations with trees. And um, now, what was that book? Uh, is it The Secret Life of Trees? I think that's one that Jenny Parks uh, has um, suggested and recommended to many people. I haven't read it yet. Um, it's, I've got a pile of books like so high next to the bed. Um, but I will get around to it. But trees are a really interesting way into some of this sort of spiritual experience um, for those of you that maybe are not yet pushing the door um, open to it. Uh, well, in fact, no, you, you are all pushing the door open to it. It's just that some of you have pushed the door open further and walked further into that space than others. But the tree that I wanted to talk to you about was actually an oak tree. Um, when I was still in the video production uh, arena, still making videos for the corporate world, I found myself on a, a, a location called the Chained Oak Farm. Now, some of you in Britain might have um, heard of the uh, Chained Oak because um, there's a massive um, fun park, leisure park, whatever you want to call it, fun park, amusement park, called Alton Towers in the UK. And... Alton Towers has a ride, it's called the Hex Ride, and it actually features a model of a, a massive old oak tree, and it's, it's modelled on the chained oak, which is just literally in a farm, in a, in a woodland, in part of a farm that's, that's next door to Alton Towers, and that's where we were filming. I was filming for JCB, the machine manufacturer, and even then, in those days, I was thinking, well, do I really want to be filming for JCB? And they think about all the damage that they've done, you know, with all those machines digging up the earth and causing all the chaos and all of that stuff. That's the way I was feeling about it. But I, you know, needed the money and quite liked working for them. It was quite a nice way to have a, you know, play with train set in real life. Um, so I was there doing this filming um, and uh, we, we were filming a little excavator and it was just running up and down this track in the woods as part of sort of atmospheric shots for its promotion, you know. 
and there was this this tree I, and I, I I was doing a bit of a recce and came across this tree I found this tree with the cameraman and I, and I had taken my dousing rods with me that day and I stopped because this tree is um, you can find pictures of it online actually if you just google the chained oak so chained as in links of chain so I was walking down this path in the woodland and, and this tree was sort of right up on the bank, probably a good 50 feet away from the, the track where I was standing. But it was absolutely massive, hundreds and hundreds of years old. You know what oak trees are like when they get to that sort of age? They are incredible things just to look at, you know, irrespective of whatever subtle contact you have with it. But this tree was literally um hanging it had hanging from its branches and it had amongst its branches chains with links in them metal chains with links in them about that big so a good three or four inches big and these chains were actually hanging around the main branches of the tree and that is the chained oak chained oak it's called and the the story is, and this is the story that goes along with the hex ride in Alton Towers, the story is that the owner of the land basically refused to give shelter to a travelling gypsy one really dark, stormy night. You know, you can imagine it out of a horror, hammer horror film sort of thing. And um, as, as a result of being turfed away, the gypsy basically put a curse uh, on the land and on the tree and said that whenever a branch falls from this oak tree, a member of you know, the family of, that owns the land, a member of the family will die, will perish. And of course, the gypsy was chased away, chased off the land. Um, some months or years later, um, sure enough, a branch did fall off that tree. And sure enough, the story goes that one of the owner's family died. And so as a result of that, that the owner commanded that this tree be strapped up with these huge chains. And it was, be, you know, this happened a long time ago because the tree, you know how trees grow around things that they, they can't kind of you know, assimilate or break. And so the tree was growing around these huge chains. When I saw this tree, I just stopped because it is incredibly impressive to look at. Um, and it also is incredibly sad to look at. And that's what struck me, is that I was looking up at this tree and I, I'd actually got my dousing rods out because I was in the habit of, um, you know, tuning into the guardian spirits of sacred sites and all this sort of thing. And I'd taken them. I don't know why. I really don't know why I'd taken them on a filming shoot with, you know, a shoot with me. But I had them. And, and I, I, I tuned in. I, I looked at this tree and I was basically going, oh, you know, bless you, look at the state, what have they done to you? And a voice said, spare your compassion. <laughs> it just, and it, it wasn't, you know, I say a voice said, it wasn't just a voice, it was a booming uh, I have to say it was a male voice. To me, it came across as a male voice, but it was a booming, incredibly old, but very strong voice. Spare your compassion. It, it didn't want, it did not want sympathy. It did not want any of that. Spare your compassion. But this was the tree. This was This was coming from the tree, and I could feel it. It, it, it hit me like a, I mean, they describe, sensitives describe this as a download, you know, but you've heard it, you've heard people talk about downloads before, you get downloads from spirit, you get, you get downloads from tree. It's like a packet of information comes at you. And actually, well, this is the way it, it feels to me. And actually you have to sort of, you, you get the impression of the first few words and then you have to kind of stay with the energy of it to actually be able to allow it to unravel and to come through. And what, it, what this tree was basically saying was spare your compassion. Look around you. There are hundreds of trees here, but I am special. I am different. And it, this was what it was saying. And I'm like, whoa, I can't, whoa, okay. And, 
Uh, but, I, you know, I looked around and, yeah, sure enough, there, obviously I was in a wood, so there were hundreds of trees. And, yes, it was special because it had that chain hanging off it. But, good God, I still felt sorry for it. And I thought, well, what do you mean? You know, I thought, what do you mean I'm special? No, I didn't get anything resp any response at all from that. And so, obviously, I mean, I had the cameraman next to me. He was all used to me with these things because he used to come with me when we were filming the, the stuff with Hamish Miller and that, that sort of thing. So he knew I was a bit wacko at that time. Uh, in his words. Um, but uh, so we carried on. We, we had to get the filming done. So later on that day, I came back past that tree. And do you know what? There was a school party, a party of children, and they were probably only about, they were probably primary school age. Um, and they were climbing all over that tree. And they had been taken there to see the real chained oak. So their teacher was with them and there were there was probably 15 or so, maybe more. And these kids were laughing and playing and it was such a completely different picture to what I'd witnessed earlier on that day. And I, I just stopped and thought, oh. and he said, and the tree instantly said, see, I am special. Because it's the only tree in the woods where all the children were playing. Now, it was astonishing. It was absolutely astonishing. And, um, you know, I really wish I'd taken some proper photographs of that tree. And, um, but, you know, I was talking about it to somebody um, a little while later on. And you know what she said? She was a, she was a sensitive, uh, lovely lady, a good friend of Hamish Miller's. And um, I don't know why I mentioned Hamish there. Uh, her, name was, her name was Gail, Gail Elaine. Um, and she said, well, that tree with its chains, it's like the chains is like our baggage because it's our baggage that makes us special. And it's our baggage, also our emotional baggage, that also causes us pain. But part of the time, it's our emotional baggage that makes us who we are as human beings. And so that tree was not only, I mean, not only, bless him, uh, or it, not only uh, enabling um, a lovely connection for me, so therefore that it was building my confidence, but also showing me something very clear about what it is to be human. And it was accepting what it was. This is what has always struck me with that as well, with that, 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 that particular tree. It's like, because I've never had a conversation like that with, with other trees. I've had conversations, but I've not had one that says I'm special. And with such, you know, it's like, yeah, well, you just watch yourself so giant, because if you're not careful, I'll be having a go. Um, you know, that, that sort of, it wasn't hanging, it wasn't mucking about that tree. It was definitely, I know what I'm doing. I'm here. Oh, the other thing about it was that actually the way that it was sitting, and I think some of the photos online will show this, the um, the roots of the tree, because it was on the bank, it, the roots were all um, hugging the rocks, the boulders of where it was had grown. And there was a, he did say something about the fact that he was with these rocks. This was part of his place to be with these rocks and things. So there was an assimilation, there was a, an acceptance in its awareness that it was part of a very specific place and that basically the impression that I got was that these rocks were like its buddies. You know, I mean, we know that um, rocks, stones will speak as well in this, exactly the same way. You can talk to stones and rocks in exactly the same way and get information back. But what I tend to find is that they really take a, a fair amount of time to, to, to come through. Um, and so I don't know, whether, I really don't know whether that was just something from that particular tree, but maybe because of the amount of human interaction that it had, I don't know, I really don't know. I've spoken, I had a really nice chat with the beach, yeah, beach, you know, the nice smooth bark beach trees that can grow massively. Lovely, lovely trees, they are fantastic. And I, I spent a lunchtime once in the Forest of Dean. Um, I'd gone for a walk and just sat with a tree there and had a really nice conversation. But that was a very different kind of feeling. That was very much, um, you know, yeah, welcome. Spend your time here. Relax. 
um, tune in and just, you know, allow um, the peace of the tree, actually. And, and when I got up to go, uh, I said, see you again. And, and he, he said, yeah, you will, <laughs> which is like, yeah. And in fact, we've got a, a reasonable size beech tree now growing in this back garden here, which is beautiful. And there's also this aspect of trees where you can quite often find a king tree or a queen tree, uh, the tree that is in charge, not in charge, the tree that is the superior tree, the, the yeah, the, in charge uh, of an area. Um, if you think about, um, especially in, in woodlands where you've got a decent sized bit of wood, you can quite often find that there'll be some of the older trees usually would be the king and queen, the guardian, or the gateway sometimes in, into a forest. Um, so there's all sorts of things, interesting stuff. That process of communicating with trees is, um, you know, it's there for all of us. And it's just such a huge opportunity to actually, um, you know, to accept their wisdom, really, I suppose. And it's quite, it's a very, very humbling thing. So fabulous opportunity to tune into trees. Um, don't feel too embarrassed if you're if you want to go and hug a tree. You don't have to hug it, you know, as that that uh, story about the chained oak illustrates, you can do it, you know, you do it from a distance. You don't even need to be in its auric field. Um, but there is a wonderful, well, you would have seen it. You've seen it on some of the videos. You can do a wonderful um, test with trees and you would have seen Hamish doing it. He does it in one of the videos where you just douse to see the resting auric field and then send it some love and then see how far out the auric field expands. That's a lovely thing. I think next year what I'm going to do is to do, try and do more work um, for those that are less, you know, haven't pushed the door open quite so far about the benefits of nature because it's part of our spirituality, really. It doesn't matter. You don't have to get, oh, well, that's a new age or... But it's a Wiccan, or it's a, you know, it's all magic. You don't have to sort of put the label on it. It's just, it's, you know, we, sorry, I don't want to talk like that, but because I know you guys won't do that, but some, you know, people do that come to the channel. I, I get a little bit fed up with people that say, oh, this is so new age. And you think, oh, I don't even know what new age is. But just the opportunity to sit with nature and sit in nature and, and recognize how beneficial it is, it's fantastic. Um, What's the best way to connect to trees? Well, yes, uh, Sean. Um, okay. I mean, I, I personally have found that the best way is to simply sit at the bottom of the tree and sit with your back to the tree and to actually just meditate. So you don't have to try to communicate with it. Just, just sit there and allow yourself, you know, you know what I say about meditation? It's the foundation stone of all of this, this inner work. But if you can just sit there, and you see, if you're just sitting at the base of a tree, even if you're sitting somewhere that's fairly busy, you, it's, you don't look like a nutter to the general public. You could just sit there and sit with the tree and close your eyes and just drift off and drift and be and know that that tree knows you're there, because it does. There's absolutely no way that you can be resting against a tree and it not be aware. It knows you're there, right? That tree will connect with you if it wants to. What you can do, Sean, is before you sort of really try and relax into that space, is to simply ask the tree to speak out loud in, in your head. Verbalize, you know what I mean by verbalize it in your head. So you don't speak it out loud, but you just hear that voice, your own voice in your head. Sorry, I know I'm being pedantic now. And just ask the tree to say, if you have a message for me, then please share it with me. I'm, you know, I am open to receiving your wisdom or any message that you wish to convey to me. Just be, you know, as open as you can be like that. But you do need to do it without, like, you know, there's no, not much point in taking the dog with you, uh, you know, because the dog's going to interrupt your focus and your concentration. And equally, if you've got a little one, um, then, you know, they're either going to get bored if they're old enough to get bored or they're going to be, you know, prodding you to get your attention. Yeah, build the relationship with the tree. That is that is a really good bit of advice, actually, because you do. it's like anything, isn't it? You get used to each other. 
obviously the tree you know you've got the tree of life and the, you, the tree trees are very distinctive in their shape aren't they and my guide i remember one of the things that he was talking about some years ago was that basically our lives tell me if i've already told you about this but basically our lives are like a tree so there's there's all of the all of the, the main trunk and all of the little the branches out going into the twigs, going to the small minutiae of the twigs. It's all, boof, there it is, that's our life uh, in all its dimensions. So that tree shape, if you can imagine that classic tree shape, is our life before we start it, it's there. And there are points around that tree, which are the emotional set points that we've agreed to hit in our time, in our particular life. So what, what Merthyn was saying was it's not so much that you follow a predestined path, it's actually that you, that tree is there and it's, it's there in all possible possibilities. So all possibilities are there in that tree shape. You know, if you imagine, if you imagine, okay, I mean, let's not go into too much detail. There's a danger that I'm trying to get caught up in the detail, but imagine that tree shape, that classic silhouette that you see in a, in a winter time against the light, and that is your life. And as you go around the branches, you know, at this point now, I might be over here on this particular branch, right? But depending on what choices I make, I'm either going to continue to move up that branch or I might zip across to over here onto a completely different branch because the choice I've made here takes me over to this aspect of my life. And so you, does this make sense? So you can see that how, how you, as you make your little choices, you might progressively move across branches, branches. These would be different topics, different subjects. But, you know, if let's say, okay, let's take a, take a maybe this is a bad example, but let's say uh, one, let's just say, it's not rooted in real life, but let's just say I was, uh, uh, had a path, a potential pathway in my life that was ending up in alcoholism, right? Really cheerful. So let's say that. So that's not a great route to be going down, but I could be going down that for many years of my life. Maybe this is, uh, in fact, from my 20s. Um, but what is it that takes me off that path and over here onto one that is, is not an addicted, you know, living an addicted lifestyle? all of those little choices as we go along, isn't it? You know, it's not, it's not really ever, sometimes, but it's not very often one big choice that says, actually, I'm going to change from my life choice to be a non, you know, a non-addict, non-addict, the, the, the little choices. What I'm saying is that that applies to every aspect of your life. And in particular, in the way that you open up to spirit and your path that you take as you open up to spirit. The reason I'm saying this and it's a bit of a poor link through from the the tree story. But there's another story that I wanted to share with you, which is which is one that my guide um, took me on, uh, took me on a little journey. I mean, literally physical journey. I was driving back from a client. I, so I was in a production meeting. Again, this is in the old days when I was um, first opening up to Spirit and I was still running the production company. And I'd gone to a production meeting some miles from my house. But the route that I would take there was um, a rather lovely one through countryside. But I, you know, like all of us, I'd got my habitual route. And on this day, as I was leaving the client, uh, my man, the voice, my guide said, you're going to take a different route home. I said, really? Why is that? He said, I want to show you. And so at that time, I, I was here, I could hear him as a guide and I, I, I could feel his, pre you know, feel his presence. That was the, what I mean is that was the stage that I was at in, in learning the mediumship. So he, I would often drive and have him talking to me in, the, in my ear. And on this occasion, he said, you're going to take a different route home. Oh, okay, fair enough. And so we, uh, we were driving, um, if any of you know this, this is from um, Stroud in Gloucestershire back to the Forest of Dean. So it's, it's through woodland, it's through a rather lovely magical valley, um, and then it's across, you know, and then you come down through into the Forest of Dean. But, but where I was, was on the Stroud side of uh, the journey. Stroud is a little village in Gloucestershire. It's known for having a lot of ley lines in it. Uh, ley lines, I use that in inverted 
commas. So energy lines. So I was driving. Um, we, I was on my normal route, and then he said, take a left. So I took a left, which was an unusual turning for a start. And basically, you know, probably know what I'm going to say, the road got narrower and narrower, and based, in the end, we ended up on a bit of a single track. And I'm going, is this really, why, is this really where you want me to come to? He said, yes, I want to show you how things can change in your life um, by taking different choices and I'm like well really I kind of know that I get the idea but this is when he was also talking to me about the tree shape that I just tried to describe to you and so I was following the voice and following his instruction and thinking well I'm damn glad I haven't got another meeting today because this is going on a bit getting completely you know days before sat, sat nav getting completely um, lost and then suddenly I found myself at um, come driving into a car park of a golf course. And I said to him, probably out loud, I don't know, I said, what on earth have you done here? Why am I in a car park? Where, where am I going to, I've got to turn around now and go back. He said, no, just keep going. And I said, but there's nowhere to go because there were cars parked. It was obviously a lunchtime or something. The cars were parked. There was a golf club in the distance. And he said, head towards the golf club. Okay, well, I'll drive. So I drove around through the car park. He said, just keep going into the corner. I said, but there's nothing there. And he said, wait and see. I kept driving. And as I got, I was literally within about a minute. And of the corner, there was a gap between the buildings, wide enough for a car. And he said, go through the gap. And I drove, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I drove through this gap. But then, of course, I found myself at the front of the golf club, which is where you'd expect to be. And of course, it was a wide open vista and you'd travel down and there's an exit going, you know, the main entrance, basically. I was back through and down, followed the road round. And he said, see, now what he was saying was the choices that you make at each moment will take you from one point on your, your tree, your life, to another point in a completely unexpected way. If you trust what you're being told and trust what you're getting, if you... If I hadn't have trusted him, I know it's a little, little story. It's a little thing just to drive to the other end of the car park, but on the basis of the voice. If you trust your guidance, then <laughs> having made that decision, that choice, what is then building on the other end of it, right? Some years later, probably a good 10 years, 12 years later, when my wife and I had sold up the house and we were living in the first house that we bought up here in Yorkshire. And we were, we were living in a, in a, it was a nice little house, but it was little. And we had never really intended to stay in that house for long because it was too little. Uh, there's no two ways about it. It's just, it was a small house. The main reason that we'd um, sold the house in the first place was to cover the debt that we that I'd accrued in this failing business I've been running. Uh, running a failing business for a good ten years is not um, a financially, you know, profitable exercise. So um, we were steadying ourselves, if you like, in our first move when we moved up to Yorkshire. We'd said to the to the universe, "Where do you want us?" And, and Yorkshire was where we ended up. Um, and I was in very good connection at the time with my guide. And so we were living in this house. And as is the way with me, um, I started redecorating. In fact, we, we completely uh, renovated that house. We had builders into that house, that first house in Yorkshire. And we ripped it apart and we started to rebuild it. We put another bedroom in and we changed its format uh, completely. It was just to, to maximize the space. And um, what I was saying was, as is my want, it started to decorate and then sort of gently lose interest because there's obviously other things that take, take, your, take time. So I, we were living in this house that was half decorated. Now, for a house healer, you might say, well, that's not a very good example, is it? Well, actually, um, like you've heard me say many times, I am a work in progress and usually the houses I live in are also work in progress. But. The point that I want to make with this little story is about the connection with my guide because I would meditate every day and I would have conversations with my guide every day in the manner that I've described 
with literally conversations, hearing him, we would have this chit chat. One day I was meditating and he just simply said, it's time to move house now. And I'm like, what? It's, <laughs> and he said, it's time to move house now. And I was like, oh dear God, I haven't, I, but it's not ready to put, it's, you need to put it on the market now. You need to look for your next house now. Oh my God. So um, <clears throat> basically my, my concern was, but I've got weeks and weeks of work to do on the house to get it presentable to, to get an estate agent in if, if you really want us to sell and to look. So I looked obviously in right move, you know, over the next few days. And yeah, sure enough, there was a house there that we really wanted, this house. And so I then had the choice of putting my business on hold for a couple of months. I think it was a couple of months, might not have been quite a couple of months. Um, or, you know, it, and so I had the choice of putting my business on hold, this, in other words, trusting what I'd heard, right? And therefore taking the risk that I wouldn't get income for a couple of months because I was going to have to decorate. I was going to have to concentrate on getting the house ready for the market. So my choice was, do I listen to the voice? Do I trust the voice? Do I trust the voice? Do I trust my own perception of, have I really heard that voice? Because although you can have these conversations, you know, not being a, not being a natural intuitive, not being born with it right from day one, you know, I still sometimes go, what the... Really? I don't think I, I don't think I heard that right. And at that time, that was a very real presence. But I trusted him. And I said to Nikki that, look, this is what's happened. This is the choice we've been given. This is a house that's come up. Do you want to see this house? You know, do you want to view it? So we did view it and we did take the action. And we did decide that I would focus on decorating the house for two months. But, you know, in those two months, that was a really scary two months because I was very aware that I could just have been making that up. I could have been making that up, that connection, that that voice could have been there because his voice, his voice is like my voice, but different. It's like it has an aspect, you know, that internal reading voice that we all have. So, I can hear my internal reading voice when I hear him talking for at me, to me, <laughs> at me quite often, when I hear him talking to me. His voice is very similar to mine, but it is equally not my voice, right? Does that make sense? There, and there's a, oh, I mean, there's all sorts of feelings that go along with that connection as well. But what I'm trying to get at is that the, is that even when we've had a, a, a substantial relationship with a guide who we have grown to trust through various exercises and time spent with them, there is still an element of doubt and there is still an element of, is that really uh, 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 an, in, an instruction or a guidance from the subtle realms, or is it just me making it up? And the answer is, as far as I'm concerned, I actually think it's a bit of both. Because I, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying for one moment that spirit guides do not exist. Absolutely not. What I'm saying is the other way around, is that actually the amount of perspective that we have to shift in order to see what the human being really is in, in actuality, with all of its potential to be linking into those aspects of personality in the subtle realm, the requirement, the, the shift of perspective is pretty major to be able to actually see the oneness of everything. It's the oneness of all of that potential that is the amazing thing. And I suppose that's why I've told you those little stories today, those, those experiences of mine, is to illustrate how those connections can really impact your, your reality and how important it is to, to have that gap. If you want to explore the spiritual aspect of, of life, of reality, of being, to have that gap where you can independently observe. 
in other words, to dissociate yourself, to distance yourself from your own being, literally, from your own beliefs, from your own presence, because the essence that is, as we've talked about before, the essence of the oneness of source that is in here is actually distanced from that aspect that is Tim Walker or that aspect that is Ellen or is Rick or is Mark or is Billy or is Keith. And that ability to distance and that ability to separate and that ability to actually, it's almost taking separation right round in full circle because it's actually joining. It's a separation from that ego identity and pulling back and joining the oneness, if you want to call it that, as a corny expression, but that process. That process is as much a wave, as we talked about earlier on, as any other process that we human beings go through. So it's not something that you kind of go, yes, I can do this. I can do this now. This is, this is the way it's going to be now. I'm going to have these conversations with my guide for the rest of my life. It kind of fluctuates, and it does for everybody, unless they're really a natural medium, and that's fine, because, and you'll know if you are, you know, once you've got it locked, if you're born with it from day one, that is your life, that's your life pattern. Your tree, that pattern of the tree that your life is, is always there with that divine guidance as part of it right to the fore if you're that sensitive which some of you are and part of your battle part of the trunk of your life that is the battle that is the exploration is is who am i is to understand why is it that you seem to see the world so differently to everybody else especially when you're young that's part of your battle those of you that are that sensitive part of the battle is actually recognizing the difference. And I, I was in conversation with somebody and I've been talking to the, the house healing uh, students a lot about introversion and that aspect of self. When you, when you understand, if you're an introvert uh, and, you, and you, <laughs> you spent, like I did, spent probably 40 plus years of my life thinking, why, why, why don't I enjoy being amongst people and doing these things that other people, like my brother, is a is a really big time extrovert. He get, really gets his energy from being with people, um, uh, whereas I don't. And so like I was constantly comparing myself to my older brother when I was growing up and thinking, why do I not? You know, what, there must be something wrong. There must be something wrong with me. But when you realise and somebody helps you see these aspects of self, which are just unique gifts that we all have like I said right at the top, the baggage from the chained oak representing the emotional baggage that we all have, but even characteristics that we all have as independent human beings. You see your gifts and it's great, it helps you.